Welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today, we're joined by Garth Illingworth, who's come across to us from uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, you may recognize a similarity in accents between Garth and myself. Uh, he is a graduate of the University of Western Australia, where he did a Bachelor of Science, and then a PhD at the Australian National University in Canberra. Uh, his uh, career has been interested in the structure, kinematics, stellar populations of elliptical and SO class galaxies. Uh, he terms his galaxy, uh, galaxy archaeology. So I'm sure you're going to hear a lot about that in today's talk. Uh, he uses the uh, Keck 8 to 10, 10, 10 meter telescopes and uh, also Hubble data uh, to do his analysis. Uh, and he is uh, currently the chair of the Astronomy and Astrophysics Advisory Committee. Uh, which uh, recently came out with uh, an interesting uh, assessments on J uh, JWST. Uh, also uh, of note is that Garth actually worked in the late 80s and early 90s on the first designs for JWST. So uh, if you have any burning JWST questions, maybe you could uh, have them at the back of the talk. So uh, today, though, we're going to hear about uh, his uh, work with Hubble, uh, looking at uh, galaxy buildup in the first billion years of the universe. So if you'll uh, join me in welcoming Garth. Good. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you all very much for coming too. One minor correction. I was chair for five years of the committee, but I got off that a couple of years ago. That was a long time, writing annual reports for Congress every year on the state of astronomy is a big task, important task, so it's fascinating. But that's a different topic. So today I'm going to talk about a lot of work that has gone on over the last decade essentially on galaxies in the early universe. And uh, as I look at this, I'm not sure how one does tweets on this. The whole of my first slide probably excuses a, a typical tweet. But anyway, let's go on and see. So I'm going to focus on results from Hubble. Spitzer has played a major role too and ground-based telescopes. The largest ground-based telescopes are also doing a lot on searching for galaxies in the early universe. And as I noted, we will concentrate largely on these two telescopes on the results because that's where the center of my interest and activities have been. Now, one of the things that we always need to keep in mind is when we collect data from telescopes, what we're trying to do is understand the universe, understand galaxies as they build up, stars, whatever the topic we're looking at. What we need to do that well is theory. And so along, that has gone hand in hand with the remarkable observations, are remarkable developments in modeling galaxies in the universe. And so you see these simulations, and this is an eight-year-old simulation. Current ones are way better than this in addition to you know, the, the developments that have gone on with uh, the large telescopes. So this is in the background. A lot of the results, the interpretation depends on the models to understand what's going on. Now, one of the things that we're extremely fortunate about with galaxies is that we can look at nearby galaxies, our Milky Way, Andromeda, the Virgo cluster of galaxies, and we can do archaeology on those and look and see what we can understand about how those galaxies formed. But fascinatingly, we can take our telescopes and we can look back in time. And so we can actually do direct observations of galaxies as they're forming, going back billions of years. And in fact, we're now back 96% of the life of the universe to the first 4% for finding the first galaxies. And I will show you that later on in this talk. So I am going to concentrate on the direct observation but a lot of what we understand about galaxies has come by combining these two sets of results. So let me put the, set the stage for you, because I have trouble remembering this and I work in this field all the time. So just the time frame. We talk about redshifts all the time. You know, we're working at redshift six, at eight, at four. 
just, but it's very useful to have the numbers in mind. And so here they are, a redshift 4 object is 1.6 billion years after the Big Bang, redshift 6 is about a billion years, redshift 10, half a billion years. So these numbers are useful. And what is interesting, and of course, the age of the universe, we now know extremely well, remarkably well, 13.75 billion years. And what has changed over the 20 years or so since we first launched Hubble is that we can push out to way earlier times. In the 19, early 1990s, before Hubble went up, we could basically look at galaxies that were just half the age of the universe, looking back 7 billion years or so. Hubble, with its first ultra-deep field, set us out further, another few billion years earlier, and with each new camera that we've put on Hubble, we've been able to push back the time that we could look at and find galaxies. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today are galaxies in this time frame, in the first billion years roughly, that Hubble has been exploring basically in the last two years. It's only come about with a new infrared camera that came on Hubble in the last couple of years. Glimpses were found before that, but the real work has been done since the servicing mission in 2009, early 2009. James Webb will push out into an incredibly important era when the first galaxies were forming. This looks like a small change, but trust me, this is really tough to go from here to here. Requires cryogenically cool, extremely large telescope, very challenging technically, and going to be tough, long observations to do this. So why are we interested in this period in the first billion years? Essentially, it's when the seeds of all of today's galaxies were put in place. When I say build up, I mean formation, growth, the early life of the galaxies, of all galaxies, basically were seeded and grew in this period. Massive galaxies, I'll show you, just started to build up in this time frame too. The first heavy elements were born in this time frame and dispersed into the interstellar medium. So all of Earth, everything that around us came from seeds that were planted in, these, in this time frame. So, and also the universe as a whole was reionized. So this is a fascinating period. So the period that I'm going to be talking about is this period in here, Big Bang, going across neutral material for a long time. Then the first stars formed out here and we started to get the universe reionizing from a few hundred million years out to about a billion years. And in that time, the first galaxies were forming and this is no coincidence. We think that was strongly coupled but proving that has turned out to be a challenge. So let me show you a little more esoteric diagrams here. The WMAP satellite told us a lot about the early universe by looking at the microwave background, the fluctuations, and it told us that reionization most likely occurred around redshift 10. So let me just show you that this is the period here where we'll be talking about today right in covering the region that uh, WMAP explored and told us reionization occurred. The other aspect here, which is sort of a complicated figure, but I just want to point out down here. So this is just the mass density of galaxies, of halos actually, versus their mass. An object here is a sort of a galaxy like our Milky Way in the current time. If you look in here and you can see that at redshift 10, half a billion years after the Big Bang, there were no galaxies like our Milky Way. The, the dark halos had not come together yet. But by redshift 5, barely six, seven hundred million years later, yeah, six, seven hundred million years later, there were galaxy halos there that contained seeds of matter of galaxies forming that would ultimately become our Milky Way or large massive galaxies. So dramatic changes occurred in galaxies in this time frame. This is from theory, but it's very well established theory, cold dark matter, very good simulations. And so the results we're seeing certainly support this growth of galaxies in this time frame. So Hubble played an absolutely crucial role here. It opened up the early universe and it did so, I think, in large part because Three directors of the Space Telescope Science Institute realized that Hubble could make a major contribution to the study 
of galaxies overall, but particularly young galaxies, by taking extremely deep images. In general, there wasn't a lot of support in the community for this, interestingly enough. People wanted to go in and do their own little programs. The director said, no, I'm going to put in a bunch of time on this and we're going to make the data public. And as it's turned out, that was an extremely powerful decision. These data sets are rich in their utility for a wide range of programs and making them immediately public gave a lot of people the opportunity to go in and use these. And I'll show you a little later just how much has gone into these fields. So Bob Williams in the mid-90s did this, Steve Beckwith did this with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field in the early 2000s, and then we got some large programs with a new infrared camera in um, 2009, 2010 that complemented these, these areas. Now let me say just a little bit of, about how we actually find these galaxies. One of the things that's very important is that we get samples of objects that we understand where they came from, what their density is in the universe, what their characteristics are. We have to know their statistical properties very robustly. There are two ways to search for galaxies. One, the ones on the left here, is to look for emission lines of Lyman alpha in the spectra. We do this on the ground routinely because it's a very powerful technique and works well where the background is fairly high as it is in the ground, especially at high redshift. One of the challenges is that Lyman alpha itself, the line, is very easily absorbed, scattered and absorbed by hydrogen and dust. And so in the similar objects, one finds huge variations in the strength. You see between the red and blue objects here, there's zero Lyman alpha in one and a lot in another. It's hard to characterize galaxy populations by choosing samples based on Lyman alpha emission. They're important and a lot of samples have been found this way, but doing statistical studies on these is a challenge. It turns out I think that the most robust way is to find these photometrically. And so to find them by the flux in different filters. Now this is an old technique, it goes way back to work on quasars in the 1980s. It was developed very well by Chuck Steidel and work from ground-based telescope in the 1990s. And we and many other groups have used this technique now for well over a decade to find galaxies at higher redshifts. And it relies on the fact that when you take a galaxy that's star forming, there's a lot of UV flux, the light in the UV is absorbed at the Lyman limit and below Lyman alpha, particularly at higher redshifts below Lyman alpha. It makes a large break in the spectrum, so they're called Lyman break galaxies. It's a great way to get the redshift because you have this very sharp spectral feature here in the spectrum. And you can see if you take images at different parts of this spectrum, you see nothing in the ultraviolet on this one and lots of flux in the blue. There's very little signal here in this region. And so this is a ultraviolet dropout galaxy. Now there's a little video here which sometimes works. Ah, voila! So here is a bunch of filters, a galaxy spectrum at different redshifts. And so you can see that if you have filters you can choose and see what the flux is in the different filters and isolate where this break occurs. And so you can choose galaxies that go, let me see if that will start again, yeah. So from redshift 3, 4, just depending on which, so you observe with a whole bunch of filters with uh, cameras on Hubble and you see where the flux is low and where it's high and that gives you the redshift. It doesn't give you a very accurate redshift but you can very accurately model because you have lots of filters where this occurs and you can get a distribution. So this is a way of building up samples of galaxies and all galaxies will display this break. It's just because there's neutral hydrogen, enough neutral hydrogen around galaxies and in the universe to bring these into the sample, as long as the galaxies are in the sample. And so you can make a very robust statistical sample using this technique. This is what we did back after the advanced camera flew in 2002. It was put on board Hubble and within a couple of years all the new data from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, from the Goods Field, other areas in the sky were used and we assembled a sample of 500 redshift 6. Two years earlier 
there were essentially no redshift six galaxies known. So Hubble turned on a whole new regime by launching and putting on a new camera. And so you see, these are typical of galaxies a billion or so years after the Big Bang, small blobby objects, and these are the brightest. They get fainter from here. So they get hard to find these galaxies. And I'll talk a little later too about the challenges of finding these. But this was remarkable that within a few years, these public data sets had allowed not just us, but other people as well to go in and find very large samples of galaxies. There is one other approach which is used, which in itself is powerful but different. This is to go to very rich clusters of galaxies and to look for objects which are highly magnified and very red, i.e. those ones which you think might be at high redshift because they don't have any blue light. So essentially, the, all the neutral hydrogen has taken all the light out below about 8,000 angstroms or 7,000 angstroms. So this galaxy was found a few years ago, and it's at redshift, what was it, 6.8 in this cluster of galaxies. Now, one of the very nice things about this technique is that you get a lot more information. So you don't find very many of these, but I'll show you later, you get a lot of information. One example here is that you can use this to try and get, because it's fairly bright, you can measure it more readily and certainly you can measure it in the infrared. You can get more information about the spectrum and try and set constraints on its mass. Very important parameter for early galaxies, so I'll come back to that. But just to give you a sense, we now have something like 20,000 galaxies at Redshift 4. Most of these are found from the ground, most of these are Lyman Alpha sources, about 5,000 are found from space telescopes with the break technique. And so you can see, and this is six months ago, there were 30 of these at Redshift 8, there's now 60. This is very rapidly changing field. Tough out here, I'll show you. These are, this is hard work, you've got to push the instruments a lot. The lensing clusters, small samples, but different and very valuable. So. What I would like to spend the rest of the talk discussing are basically the results that have come about since the Wide Field Camera 3 was launched in 2009, in May. The astronauts took it up, put it on the shuttle, on, uh, on Hubble, and it tested out beautifully over summer, and the first data was taken basically with this in August of um, 2009. So the team that put in for doing a large program on this, 200 or 192 orbits. We made the data immediately public, of course, in the tradition of these fields. As, uh, and I wanted to highlight a collaborator of mine, Richard Bowens, who's a postdoc, a researcher at Santa Cruz, now a faculty member at Leiden University. Extremely capable guy. We've been working together on this for many years, an excellent team. And so we've enjoyed doing this. And so what I'm going to be talking about are the results from basically this team's activities with some other people's work put in here as well. One of the things that I like to emphasize is that we're not just discovering the highest redshift, earliest time galaxies. We're also doing astrophysics on these. So I'm going to show you some results about things that we've actually learned about these samples. Though, of course, the excitement always comes when you find a galaxy that's a little bit earlier time, a little further away than anybody else has found. That's always fun. But the real interest for astrophysicists and astronomers, of course, is when you learn about how galaxies were building up in these period. So I'm going to talk a little about these properties as I go through. Now, one of the things I wanted just to contrast with is the changes that occur when you put a new instrument on. Before the Wide Field Camera 3 went on, we had another infrared camera with a very small field. You can see it here. Here is NICMOS, this little square down here, and here is the Wide Field Camera 3 IR, the big red box. This made a huge difference having increased area. In fact, not only increased area, the detectors on this new camera were way better than the older detectors. And in fact, the overall discovery efficiency, area time sensitivity, was a factor of 40 times larger. And in, there was another factor as well. It actually had higher resolution, so the images are crisper. And so there's more information to be gained there as well. And so we worked out after looking through the data what took us 100 orbits with the old NICMOS camera on Hubble to find a Redshift 7 galaxy. We would find a Redshift 7 galaxy every few orbits with the Wide Field Camera 3. This makes a huge difference to the science you can do. 
So let me show you the deepest image of the sky ever taken. This is still from the advanced camera, my old favorite. I was deputy PI of the advanced camera. 10 years of work went into getting that instrument on the shuttle in 2002, but it's been a remarkable instrument. 30th magnitude. This goes down to five sigma for a detection. Deepest image of the sky ever taken. Widefield camera three is getting close. We're around 29.2 or three at the moment and we'll go a little deeper still. We can go deeper still. We could get as deep with Widefield camera three with more data. Ah, I'm gonna show you. It's actually the CDF South. And so it's the Chandra deep field South. This is in the Hubble ultra deep field. I just wanted to quickly show you visually the gains that you get from changing cameras. This is 72 orbits. It's a bunch of time. That's uh, four days worth of observing, over. And here is one day. And you can see it's a whole lot better <laughs> for one day versus four days. So you can imagine just how excited we got when we saw this. So before I just get in and show you the field in a little more detail on that, one of the things I wanted to emphasize was just the importance of going faint, of finding faint galaxies. It's very much like an iceberg. Really all the interest, all the mass is down beneath the surface. When we look at galaxies at modest redshift, intermediate redshifts and high redshifts, what we find is there's vast numbers of small galaxies, it's sort of what you might expect but it have it confirmed so strikingly. Bright galaxies are rare. If all you can find are bright galaxies out here, so this is magn absolute magnitude, bright galaxies, this is sort of the regime of our Milky Way, you're not gonna get to see very much or learn very much about galaxies. You really need to go faint. This is hard. We basically need the Hubble Ultra Deep Field depth to go to the level where you start to see the typical galaxy at high redshift. Half the light and UV from star formation comes at those depths, way below the brightness of galaxies like the Milky Way. So keep that in mind as we're going through, we're always pushing for depth. We like numbers and we like depth. This is a challenge. When you take those two things together, it means you're gonna ask for an awful lot of telescope time. But it's been given. I think the science has been so interesting that this region in the Chandra deep field south around, this is the Hubble ultra deep field here, this red blob in the middle, is just a wash with data from Chandra, from Spitzer, from Hubble over a long period of time. All these data sets were public. And so this is also made it a very powerful tool for astronomers overall to use. In fact, I did a calculation the other day. I knew that we'd invested a lot of resources in this area. Two thirds of a year of Hubble time has gone into this. A third of a year on Chandra, a third of a year on Spitzer. If I take the current value of those telescopes, life cycle cost, and work out what the investment is of taxpayer dollars in this area, just this little tiny spot on the sky, it's $400 million. This is a huge amount of resources. So that's one of the reasons why we think it's nice to be public. Though unfortunately, this trend was just broken recently by one of my colleagues who I must say really annoyed me by doing this. And the TAC really annoyed me by giving the time. So I hope there's no TAC members who take offense in here at this, but this really did annoy me, I can tell you, when I look at these numbers and the value that has come from this. But anyway, this is just... So here to get a sense of what we're looking at, it's a small fraction of the full moon in size. Tiny place on the sky. But uh, a place which has given us a vast amount of information about galaxies. So the data that we have taken that I'm gonna be showing you the results from basically come from three regions around here and a shallower data set with the infrared camera. And what was interesting was, as I have noted, you know, this is, these are public data sets. When this data became public in August of uh, 2009, within four to five days, three groups had submitted papers to the journal and ISTRA PH. So there's a huge amount of competitive pressure to get things out, which is great. When you think of the investment of 
resources of the community, of the taxpayer, congressional, etc. This is great. And so within a few months, there basically were five groups that had public, put papers on the web on this area. Interestingly enough, this is sort of the same groups that were competing when the Hubble Ultra D field data came out in 2003 and 2004, so it was sort of a deja vu situation. And uh, Richard Ellis put together what I thought was a beautiful chart here with uh, the unruly mob and then the listing of the papers that were published in, or put on Astro PH, submitted, all accepted in the end, or published. And now there are actually 35 papers in less than two years on these data set, on the HUDF09 data. And I think a lot of this happens because the data is public, because it's competitive. But there's, and, to my, and from what I've seen, there's not a downside. There are some problems with a few of the papers, a small fraction, but the vast majority give very similar results, there's a lot of agreement, there are details which are important which have been resolved because we've all been able to see what each other is doing quickly. So there's real value in this and this I think is a, a trend that I think is good for the future too, it's good for the field, we do good science this way. People sometimes claim that well it's better to think carefully about it, I actually find that that's not the case. You think really hard when you know you're going to be putting it on the out quickly and you've got two other groups who are going to put papers out the next day as well. So there's a lot of thought that goes into that. Okay, so let me show you a couple of galaxies now at a very early time. So here is two galaxies at Redshift 8. So this is 500, 600 billion, a million years after the Big Bang. So now we're looking back, as I said, through 95, 96% of the life of the universe. So this is how we find them. Some images in the, these two infrared filters and nothing at all in these filters. A little bit of a weak signal here, that helps us constrain the redshift. So just these two images are what we use to detect the sources and then nothing. So in fact what we're using is this uh, extremely expensive image from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field in the optical as a null detector. But anyway, that's what do we need. <laughs> it's very important because a large fraction of the images that we first get in here are contaminants. We only get rid of them by looking very carefully at these data to make sure that there's no signal down there. So this is a technique which has been refined over the last decade and which has resulted in galaxies like this at redshift six, uh, seven and eight, there are examples in this figure. Blue star forming galaxies, very compact, I'll show you some of the sizes I mentioned, very similar results from early papers from everybody. These are the three fields, it's here just because I think it's a pretty picture showing the three fields that have been the center of all this attention all around the Hubble Ultra Deep Field with a sample of the you know, little things in the middle, it's not these bright things, it's the faint things in the middle of those images are the Redshift 8 galaxies. And initially we had a handful, 10, 15 or so within the first papers. As the data has got deeper with time and as we've refined our techniques, we've gone back, we now have 130. The data set was completed last year, a year after the first data were taken, and so very large sample has come about from these new data. So what have we learned from these? By the way, this is still continuing. This is a new program. It started late, late last year. Candles, these are not very deep. They're wide area and shallower. But in fact, that's great because we need to cover all the different depths. Bright galaxies are rare, so you need to cover a lot of area. So that's what this candle survey is doing. The ERS and goods observations were intermediate in depth here and the really deep pinpoint ones are in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and these two fields over to the side here. So we take all these data together. So one of the things we can simply do is look at them. What do they look like? They look like fuzzy little blobs, interestingly, but we can measure their sizes and we can look at how that changes. So this is with redshift with time from redshift 7, about 800 million years back to couple of billion years back here. There looks to be evidence for interactions, that's just exactly as we would expect. Star forming is very, formation 
is very clumpy in these objects. So we can look at the scale and sizes. Now, I wanted to take us back just quickly to the clusters because this is where the details really help. When we look at it directly in the field with Hubble, we have resolution that's not great, kiloparsec, large fraction of a kiloparsec. It tells us a lot, but the way we can learn a lot more is those few cases where we see a highly magnified galaxy. This was back in 1997. We found this reddish object in this cluster over here. We removed this galaxy. This is what it looks like. The galaxy itself is very blue. And one of the things you can do is you can model the cluster, its potential, and see what the galaxy would look like in the source plane, in reality, if you took the cluster away. But of course, it's greatly magnified, so you get two things. You get nice, more information on the images and on the structure, much more, because you've got now high resolution. In fact, you'd need a, something like a 30 meter telescope to do this well. So this is an extremely powerful technique. Turns out in this case that half the star formation in this object is in one area which is only a few hundred parsecs across, just in this tiny blob here. And yet it's something like 20% of all the light from the Milky Way in the ultraviolet, probably more actually. And so this is an immense amount of star formation, very concentrated. This is not the only example. So here's that other one. There's another one here from another cluster found a decade later and telling us the same thing. Star formation in these objects is very concentrated, very dramatic, presumably happens in this region for a while, then there's maybe an interaction, and it happens somewhere else in the galaxy, but uh, we now have, at least from these data, some idea of the scale. So small blobby objects, as I said, but the scale's important. We can really see that the, the size is a subkiloparsec. So one of the other things that we like to do is to go look at the colors of the objects. It's another classical thing to do astronomically. In the ultraviolet, it's a very well-established technique from looking at galaxies locally. You basically look at the colors in the ultraviolet. So just here, here's a couple of examples. And so from this beta parameter, which is just a color, so more negative is bluer. So here is at redshift four, this is a function, so beta is a function of ultraviolet luminosity here. So low luminosity galaxies are very blue compared to higher luminosity galaxies. This is one of the first things that we found. And these are getting down to the point where you notice here that the reddening is really small. This is interesting. This was a pointer to something interesting going on. So as we got samples at higher redshift, one of the things we could do is look at the trend of the color for low luminosity galaxies in the blue. And it was dramatic how blue these got. In fact, it was so dramatic that uh, we published this and got immediately criticized by two or three other papers saying we couldn't possibly be right. We think they were partly right because when we went back and looked at a bigger sample, this is where they are, but it's still very blue. And what this seems to be telling us is that as we're getting out to early times, these objects are essentially dust free. Just hasn't built up enough metals yet to have dust. You know, there are a lot of things that can affect the colors, but after doing, looking at a lot of models and going through a lot of tests, dust seems to be the most likely driver of these color changes. So low luminosity galaxies at high redshift are essentially dust free. Interesting, interesting that we could learn something like that and has interesting implications for stellar evolution in those days too. So the other thing, I showed you one of these before, a luminosity function, number of objects per unit magnitude per volume element versus magnitude. Bright galaxies, faint galaxies. So there are the bright ones and there are the faint ones. And I said the slopes down here are really steep, and they are. Compared to local samples of UV star forming galaxies, these are really steep. So as we have gone back and looked at different times, we've tried to understand what the trends are. One of the immediate things that pops out is redshift eight, seven, six, five, et cetera, as you go down, you look here, the brightest objects, you're seeing progressively more brighter objects as you go to later times. Sounds perfectly reasonable, hierarchical, build up, galaxies colliding, merging, 
building up with time. So you're more massive, presumably more brighter, gala uh, brighter galaxies at later times. So this we can quantify, but before I say that, one of the things that this worked with a lot of teams, luminosity functions for many years were uh, a mess. People disagreed all over the place. By getting lots of papers out and lots of data, we've gradually understood all the issues collectively, and we now pretty much agree on the results. Within the errors, folks get very much the same results. This is a good move, but it took a while to get to this point. So we learned a lot, all of us who were doing this, about what was important to do in determining luminosity functions. So it's not trivial to do, because you really have to understand the statistics and your sampling and how you find galaxies to do that. So let me just show you a couple of examples now of the trends which affect, uh, which we've learned from looking at these galaxies. So going from redshift 8 to redshift 4 is basically from 600 million years to, um, uh, what is that, about 1.4 billion years, something like that. So it's a sort of almost a billion year period back here. So if we just now plot the UV luminosity here at the break in this function, it's a Schechter function. And it has an exponential cut off a tail at this end, power law slope, and a break point. And the break point is this L star, M star value. So here is M star versus redshift. These are the error ellipses, 87654. And here is phi star, just to give us another axis to compare. The interesting thing is here, confirms the visual impression. There's just a trend to later times of the buildup of galaxies at the bright end. So this is one of the things that we could quantify from these data. And so we can now take this and look at the value of M star and the UV as a function of redshift or time to the peak at about 3 billion years after the Big Bang. Peak of all star formation occurs around redshift 2 to 3 in here. So galaxies build up to this point, and then after that, star formation occurs in smaller galaxies as we get to more recent times. The universe has passed the peak of its activity. We're in a pretty quiescent phase. It's sort of aging. And so there's not a lot happening now. We're down virtually to where we were at the earliest times. So interesting change. But anyway, it's good to map this, and the theorists love having this, so they can plug it into the models, yes. Is that due to the lack of raw materials in these stars, or do you know why? Uh, largely, yeah. I think most galaxies, most dark halos have turned most of their gas into stars. Most of the gas is going to turn into stars has been turned into stars. So. The action is occurring still in the small ones which didn't get to do things early on. Yeah, it's, we're really in a sort of this, we've passed the peak, we're in a quiescent phase, there's not large reservoirs of gas there anymore, things have merged that were going to merge, etc. So these things are still going on, it's only a matter of degree, but it's a substantial change. So what is the other thing I mentioned earlier, is the steepness of the slope at the faint end. And so now the same graph here, we can look at M star, but now I'm interested in alpha. So alpha is the slope at the faint end. And here you see it doesn't change very much. You know, this is the M star change here. Alpha is consistent with being fairly flat, not changing a lot, and it's steep. It's much steeper at the current time. This is interesting because one of the big questions is where did all the photons come from that reionize the universe? They didn't come from quasars, from active galaxies. That we know, the number density is just not big enough for those. But every time we go through and we do it from galaxies, we also get numbers that are too small, 10, 20% of what's needed. So it's been an enigma for a long time. We think that part of the solution lies here, that these slopes are so steep that in fact, if you continue this and it Theory suggests you can go down to minus 10 and still have lots of objects. Below that point, feedback from supernovae, from winds, from massive stars, destroy objects. But if you integrate this up down to minus 10, you get an awful lot of UV flux. And it turns out that this is particularly so if the slope is a little steeper. So we went and tried to look very carefully 
at the slope of that power law as a function of time. And so we've gone from redshift 8 to redshift 1.5. Now, this is a very weak trend. And so, you know, the simplest interpretation you might say, okay, it's consistent with being flat, which it is. But formally, it's consistent with a slight slope to increasing numbers. Now, why is this important for reionization? It's important because if we look here at the faint end slope versus the amount of UV photons, and this is reference to a slope at redshift 4. So an object, a, a, a luminosity function that's as steep as minus 2 is, gives five times as many photons as one at minus 1.7. If you go to 2.1, it's 14 times more. And so if we just go back to this previous one, if you steepen this a little bit, you make a huge difference. And so we think that there's probably an interesting result in here, but it's going to take a lot more data to really isolate this and to see what's going on. But this is, I think, Liz giving us the possibility that these galaxies really could do the reionization of the universe, and it's really the tiniest little things that are doing it. It's not big galaxies, not even sort of intermediate regular galaxies, it's little globular cluster sized things almost that are doing that, where most of the star formation is occurring. Anyway, this is something that's very much ongoing, lots of discussion. We had a paper which we put on the web a month ago, which was promptly rejected, so we're going to try again, so we'll see. It's a source of much discussion. So let me say a little bit about masses. I want to do a couple more things, and then I'm going to tell you about the highest redshift galaxy that we know at redshift 10. So this was, to us, amazing. Spitzer, a little telescope like this, tiny little thing out there, was able to detect redshift seven galaxies. We were astonished when we went and looked at this. And so this is really valuable because the Spitzer data are way out in the infrared at three to four microns out here. And that means for these galaxies, they're optical rest frame. That's important because it enables us to get a much better idea of the actual mass in stars in these galaxies. In the UV, it's really tough very large scatter when you try and do it from the UV. When you do it in the optical though, you get much better answers. So this gave us the opportunity to get a sense of what the masses of these objects are. And for the theorists, this is so important. Their models are basically masses. And so they have to do nasty conversions to get stars. And so we have light, stars, and we have to do nasty conversions to get masses. It's good to do it both ways and do some cross checks. but. Before I just show you the results on this, even more amazingly, when we started to find redshift 8 galaxies, we went in and looked, and we found two objects here, which were in the Spitzer images at redshift 8. The Spitzer could actually detect these very early galaxies. We could get information on a lot more by stacking a dozen Spitzer images where we knew the location of the redshift 8 galaxy at the two different wavelengths and see light from the galaxies in the infrared. So that enables us to put constraints on the spectral energy distribution again and to get masses. Now I'm not going to spend much time on this figure. This is probably a colloquium in itself getting from there to here. What I wanted to show you was, you know, you've looked at luminosity functions, these are sort of turned around. Here are the most massive, here are the least massive. But these data are enabling us now to get masses, mass densities as a function of mass, mass functions at different redshifts. And what's nice about that in the biggest picture sense is that we can just take this and fold it in and get the buildup of light, of mass with time in the universe from star formation. Again, theorists love to see this because again, calibrates gives them a hand of un what their models are doing and gives them a lot of information. So while we've been learning a lot about the light, Spitzer and Hubble together have also enabled us to learn a lot about the way mass is. So you can see it, very big changes here. This is two orders of magnitude between the very earliest times and when the peak of star formation was around in here, a little less than two orders of magnitude. 
So there is a huge amount of mass that's built up in these first two billion years in the universe. Let me skip over this. Time is busy. Uh, time is getting on. I just wanted to show you the integrated properties. So when we look at these data and remember that we have a lot of statistical information, so we can say things about galaxy populations as a whole at a given time. And so I showed you one of those already for the mass. Here it is for light. So this is taking the total ultraviolet light at the, in the universe at all these different epochs. So we know this pretty well now. Within probably, depending on how far down you go, do we go down to minus 10? Does the slope stay the same? So there are still some questions there. But if we go down to even 10% or less of the brightest scale of a typical Milky Way now, we know this very accurately. You can see from the error bars. And so we can see the buildup of light here. And from the blue colors, we can estimate the dust, so we can actually estimate how much light we're missing, and we can turn that into star formation rate. So here is the star formation history of the universe. This is pretty impressive. You know, a lot of us, not just our group, others have been doing that. There's a lot of different points on here. But I think this is a real milestone for astronomy. One of the things that it's sort of back there, but when you step back and think about it, we know star formation in the universe over 90% of the life of the universe. That's pretty impressive. So in, a, in combining that with the mass buildup, same thing. So we're learning a lot about the global properties of galaxies in the universe and how things have changed with time. So one of the things we can actually do is now step back and ask, you know, where is all the light in the universe? Is it in the ultraviolet? Is it in the infrared? Well, it's obviously in both. What are the fractions? So we can start to, do, to make estimates of what is, where the light is and where it's coming from in the universe as well. There's fuzzy boundaries in here because it's extremely uncertain. So you look at these boundaries here. But basically there's dust reprocessed light. At later times, most of the light in the universe is dust reprocessed. At earlier times, the other way around. Most of it is just direct ultraviolet light. And one of the things that we see, particularly, is as we go out to early times, that massive galaxies are very rare. And in fact, this is the star formation rate density in different types of objects at different luminosities and sort of roughly masses. And I showed this a couple of years ago was it then? A couple of years ago or last year? I can't remember. In Paris, I immediately got a reaction from somebody who had been working in this area on these galaxies for a long time. I said, that can't possibly be true. So we had a little discourse about this. And then we agreed on a case of malt whiskey. If it's, uh, <laughs> he thinks it's uh, more than 25%. And I said, no, nah, it's less than 25%. So we'll see. Maybe with time, we'll get a better idea of but uh, it's obviously uncertain. But it's fascinating that we are in a position now to sort of get some handle on who is contributing to where, what in the star formation business in the universe. OK, so let me finish this up by jumping to what is a sort of fun discovery in many ways. A lot of work and a tough thing to do was uh, the Hubble data, we realized, gave us the opportunity to go searching for galaxies at redshift 10. Redshift 10 is 450, 500 million years after the Big Bang. So it's an amazingly long time ago. And I think a decade ago, never have thought we could do this with Hubble. It's really the infrared camera that does this. And so there was a press release with this, this little red blob here. Here's the object. It's tough. It's, you know, it's a five and a half to six sigma detection. And so here it is. Unfortunately, it's found in one filter. Oh, this is interesting. So you say, how can you possibly know that this object is at redshift 10 if it's in one filter? So one of the things we did was, so this is all the optical data in the ultra deep field down here. The additional, the other red filters. Here is the single filter that's in. It's not seen on Spitzer. This is actually good news. If it was seen on Spitzer, it almost certainly is a low redshift object. And I'll show you some examples of that. 
And the other thing that we were wor very worried about was to make sure that this was found in all subsets of the data too. So we div divide, you know, just went through the data and did different combinations. It's there weekly in everyone at the sort of expected few sigma level. So this was encouraging. So we think this object's real. Is it a redshift 10? Well, one of the things that we have to do very carefully are all these tests. And we have lots of these objects here which occur in one filter in, from Hubble. But when we go look with Spitzer, they all occur in Spitzer. Almost certainly these are objects at redshifts 2 and 3. They're dusty, evolved galaxies at redshifts 2 and 3. But they far outweigh the number of redshift 10 objects. So you've got to get this right. And so it is a challenge. And so one of the things that we've been very careful to say we call the candidate, the probability, we estimate the probability of this being real is probably 90%, maybe a little better. As we've looked at more data, we think better, but we really need some more data still to confirm this. But we're pretty happy about this. Now, we went out and we tried very hard. So here is the spectral energy distribution in purple of the Redshift 10 object. And we tried to find a plausible low redshift candidate with dust that would match this. It actually, the green dot line is the best or the we could find after trying all the different combinations. But it still turns out, because we have such a wealth of data, all these red estimates here, that we can exclude this at 99% confidence from being the a uh, that the object that we see at redshift 10 is actually a lower redshift galaxy like this. And there may be something that we haven't thought of yet that, but or observed because now there's a large database of objects at lower redshift. But this is probably pretty likely to be at redshift 10. Um, we have found objects at redshift 8.5, 8.7, 8.5, 8.6. We published them in the same paper just as to confirm that there's really a trend, a continuum of objects as you go out beyond redshift 8. So these are detected now in sort of two filters, like the ones I showed very early on. So in two filters here, and not seen in the other ones. And here are the expected redshifts all around 8.5 on this figure. And here's the potential redshift of the redshift 10 objects. It could be 9.5, 9 10, 10.5. We don't know it that accurately with one filter measurement, obviously. So uh, there's uh, considerable uncertainty. Now this always gets a laugh. We've got a luminosity function. We've got an object. We can generate a luminosity function. So we did. <laughs> Actually, this is uh, you can generate a luminosity function without any objects. You can set limits. And in fact, you can, uh, you can learn a lot from those limits. And that's more what we did here. It's not so much the detection. We actually have four fields with different depths. And so we can go in there and search for objects like this and set limits. And so we can compare it with what the other luminosity functions look like. In fact, we've refined this just recently in another paper by Pascal, where we've taken all this wide field data, and now we have many more points down here, or limits. And this is interesting, because it's telling us that something interesting is really happening out here at these very early times. And let me just quickly show you this. So here is the limit at redshift 10, using sort of that one point plus all the others, you know, for the massive galaxies. So it's consistent with the broad trend. But more interestingly, when we look at what we learn about the light out there, normalized to the limits in this one point, we see a very large change in the star formation rate density. Now, the error bars are big, as you would imagine. But this is fascinating, because this has followed a pretty uniform trend from all the previous data. Let me just show you a better example here. So here are the points that, from redshift 8 down to redshift 4, where we have very good measures and a very uncertain one at redshift 10. So the empirical trend here. So it could, in principle, still be consistent with that. But interestingly, when we go look at the theory about star formation buildup in the universe, the models tell us that this is what that might look like. So 
It may be that we really are starting to see the ramp up in the star formation in the universe. We need more objects. So we'd love to get more data to do this. We tried, but we didn't get it this time. Hopefully we'll get some in the future that can help everybody do this. And ultimately, of course, we need JWST because that will do this just great. This is where it's designed to work this problem and to go out to even higher redshifts. So let me just wrap up and say just a couple of things now. So the future in many ways for working for very high redshift objects is, if everything comes to pass, looking very rosy. ELTs, if we can build 30, 40 meter telescopes, that will be good. There are a lot of things you can do with telescopes like that. JWST was obviously designed for this, for looking at the first few hundred million years of galaxy build up. ALMA will teach us a lot about the astrophysics of galaxies at these early times as well. And that will be coming online in the next few years also. So JWST though is really crucial. And uh, JWST has had its problems. I sat last year on the independent comprehensive review panel that Senator Mikulski set up and John Cassani and I spent a lot of time after we wrote the report back in Washington talking to folks in OMB and OSTP and Congress about it. A lot of concern, it's a lot of money. This is a time when there's a lot of concerns about budgets overall. NASA fortunately is really committed to doing this mission. You know, they realize that if we fail on this, this may be the last major science project that we do. When we didn't, the center of gravity for major science projects shifted to Europe for high energy physics and the memories for these sort of things are long when it comes to projects like this and a failure on JWST would not be good. So we emphasize to folks that it's really in good shape I and mean, all the mirrors have now been polished. These are beryllium mirrors polished to a very high degree of accuracy, they've all been delivered and so 60% or so of the hardware has now been delivered. This telescope technically is in good shape. It was screwed up royally in a management cost schedule um, situation. And so we made recommendations for getting it back on track. So far, the three arms of government back there on this have not really come together. They need to, otherwise we're gonna be spending a lot of money on this mission for a long time to get it launched. But I hope that, you know, that uh, we'll get the funding we really need in the next couple of years to get over the peak of funding on this and to get it towards launch. But, and then I hope, you know, in seven or eight years time, when I'm a little older here, I come back and I talk about something that looks like this in the first half billion years before reionization. So maybe I'll get to do that. But here's a quick summary, but I think I've said a lot of these things several times, so I should wrap it up at this point. And thank you very much for all your time. <laughs> Garth, can I kick up the questions with, uh, straight away you said yeah. uh, um, before reionization with the JWST, uh, uh, how, how is that possible? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I think it's a matter of degree. Right. I, I think you know that reionization occurred over a long time span and obviously when the first stars formed they started to reionize the universe locally. But you might think before the bulk of reionization occurred. And so if WMAP is correct, you know, you go back beyond redshift 12, there's probably most of the universe is still neutral at that point. But I don't know. I mean, that's one of the things that we will have to see and learn. Okay. So when you showed the uh, luminosity functions for the z equals 4 out to z equals 8, I was surprised you didn't show similar things for lower redshift. Do you have those data and how well does the trend go yeah, that, as you get to the local universe? Very interesting question. One of the reasons why I concentrate on 4 to 8 is because we've done those with very consistent data sets. It's all Hubble data, objects found in the same way, though with different filters. As you go to slightly lower redshifts, you now start to get into a different regime where they're found with ground-based telescopes largely. We can do it from space. Now with the new UV camera on Hubble, and what we, we really do need to build up some deep UV imaging so that we can just do the same technique all the way down to less than one. 
Um, but there, there are very good results from the ground-based work. I didn't mean to, to say that there were not. It's just it's much easier and in a sense more robust just to talk about things that are done in this very consistent and internally consistent way. I was just interested to see whether the break in that... Yeah, it, it gets flatter. So as you go down to below redshift 2, it starts to flatten out. It goes 1.7 for a while and then 1.5. Um, so the trend is sort of what you would expect and the, you know, it continues still to brighten. And we have some preliminary data from some early UV data, but we need more. We and others need more on this. Can I follow on on this? Sure. Um, that was a discussion about the slope. Now let's focus for a moment at the bright end where you said that uh, getting brighter and brighter was the lower and lower redshift. So there is some claims, and I think they are quite r clear, that, that by redshift 4 or so we have some very massive galaxies, and I mean some quasars even. Yes, and, and very so, much so. Is that consistent with the hierarchical build-up, or is there an, a need for another process, like, like monolithic kind of collapse of some yeah, major I structures? You know, the challenge here is the data is, the samples are not large. The masses, you know, we need to put these all together. I don't think it's a particular problem yet, though every now and again something comes up that sort of looks like it's three, two sigma away or three, and think, oh, wow, where did that come from? And so I think it's one of these open questions that has a lot of interest in it. Things are different at the bright end. Even at earlier times, it's clear to us that there's more dust there in the very brightest in the very brightest ones. So I don't know what the processes are that lead to this, but there is something that changes when you get beyond some mass. But exactly how, what this is, and what the what drives it, I, we just don't know. I think, but it's a very interesting question. But it's tough because statistics are small. And so this whole question of uh, what, what are the fractions of evolved galaxies, what's the mass in evolved galaxies at redshift 4 and 5, we just don't know the answer to that yet. The highest uh, 6.1 or 2, and that's been around for a long time, I think it's something like that. It's been around for a long time. So people have been looking, but they haven't found much earlier. GRBs keep popping up earlier, but not quasars. <laughs> okay, um, my next, uh, the next question has to do with these little teeny things, uh, 0.7 kiloparsecs and smaller, uh -huh. can you even call them galaxies? Uh, might you regard them as uh, uh, globular clusters or even things? Um... Yeah, no, I, I think they're really galaxies. I mean, these are in halos. These are sort of 10 to the 9th solar mass objects, a lot of those, so they're very compact. Oh. Um, the halos are going to be 10 to the 10th, so, you know, these are significant objects in many cases. And has, has it been ruled out that reionization could happen before galaxies even started forming uh, from you know a generation of massive stars? Um, probably not, for two reasons. One is the WMAP observations are pretty good these days, and they really say the peak of reionization was around 10, and there's probably not much occurring before about 14 or 13 or something. Um, and we know already from looking at the Spitzer data on the Redshift 8 galaxies that they have spectral energy distributions which suggest that they started forming stars two or three hundred million years earlier. So that they started forming stars at probably Redshifts 12 or 11. So there's indirect evidence. And so, so the combination of these things suggests that you know, galaxies probably did play a major role in this. But again, you know, this to be quantified, it really needs JWST in significant numbers. With Hubble, we could maybe get another handful of, um, you know, if we spent 400 orbits on Hubble and a lot of it in the H band, etc., we could probably get a handful of redshift 10. But you know, we're not going to get the hundreds needed to really address what is happening as a function of time. But the indications certainly are that uh, galaxies existed earlier than that, and. Uh, but how early, I don't know. First, uh, if you want to carry away a number, I mean, people talk about the first stars anywhere between redshifts 25 and 15. Over a long period, it depends on the density. And galaxies sort of a little later in the high density region, so again over a wide range in redshift starting to build up. 
Garth, how much longer do you expect uh, the Wildfield, uh, Whitefield camera to be operating? I hope a long time. <laughs> you know, the JWST, the ICRP said if NASA and the government funded a ride, it could launch late 2015. There's no way that's going to happen because they couldn't fund it. It was the right profile. So they're talking probably 2017 now. So we would like to keep Hubble going for as long as possible. And, you know, $10 billion in current dollars of taxpayer money has been invested in that program. So it's absolutely trivial amounts to continue operating. So whatever we can do to continue operating that telescope, we should do. The advanced camera is still working. NICMOS, you know, the, these detectors and the cameras work for a long time, fortunately. So wide-field camera, I hope, will go for a long time. But who knows? It's in space. It's always a crapshoot, as you know. <laughs> you never quite know what's going to happen. Well, uh, Garth, as a uh, memorial of your ah, uh, of your talk here today, we have you. a uh, special SETI antique mug. It's not quite <laughs> right. 13 billion years old, but it's, uh, <laughs> it'll get there eventually. Well, it could have some, <laughs> could have some material. Yeah, on. that's right. A few atoms. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, thank you. Please join me in uh, thanking Garth. <laughs> All right, thank you.